This is GT No Re. I'm Daniel. Hey, it's Jim. Mm. This is Tim. This is John. On D&D Beyond, which is Watsy's new cash grab, but it's kind of useful. So temper my negativity with positivity. And the fact that we have bought it. Yes. Uh, and- they had an article or video or whatever on resurrection and character death. I have not read it because I don't care what they say. <laughs> I think Jim might have read it or watched it or whatever it is. Yeah, I I watched it, and honestly, their take on it was that you know the system is is capable of having all kinds of attitudes towards it, and in some it might be a hard stop for a character, and in other it might be part of the story. And then they that they talk about that for like thirty seconds, and then they go uh, with this fellow who talks about it for the next ten minutes about how it is part of the story arc and the planes, which I think is really inherent in their fifth edition. I, th- I think that's their kind of unspoken attitude towards it. The death is only temporary, that your hero exists forever. And if he, if, he, if he doesn't have a body at that time, he exists on some plane somewhere and is having an experience of the world. And it's always possible that he could return to his body and that could change his experience. He could be... Uh, he could walk around peaceful, or he could be tormented, or he could have flashbacks to what's on the other side. He could have special knowledge from the other side. And I'll say that for us, like, we have never, ever, ever done that. I, I nope. can think of no characters that have ever even been actually resurrected. And never even campaigns. thought about raising a character from the dead. I think oh, most by the way, that's been because we've never even come close to a level that can feasibly do that. But, and, we never, and we never played long enough, to, I guess, to really care about the characters. Wow, we've, we've think, played like, long. We've like, I uh, feel we, like, like I feel like we have. We've had characters ninth or tenth level before. Uh, in, in Shackled City, Not which was in four E. Yeah, but that's it, still D and D. In four E and in three point five E. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. So, but but we did. We definitely had opportunities to have players resurrected, to have players die, uh, and then have it to be part of. The narrative somehow to be an interesting storyline uh, centered on the character or something like that, just as is described. But but you know we've been playing together for a really long time, a lot, a long, long time. And wow. Okay. Let's <laughs> say uh, two thousand three. <laughs> yeah. And now so it's like twenty eighteen. That's fifteen years. That's crazy. That's out of control. Okay. Uh, we've been playing together a long time, and this is a topic that I, we've all kind of like you know, tacitly agreed on, I, I guess, or it's it's just implied in our attitudes. So if you're running it and you're making stuff up, it's just an entire another pl- yeah uh, plane. <laughs> <laughs> he did it of work. Yeah, I feel so. So so why why planes? I uh, you know it, why have we never talked about like a heaven and hell really in the world and all the other alternatives that have been thought up? You know you know Uncle Gary. Uh, I understand he was a Christian, right? I don't know about that, actually. Uh, I understand I, that he was. Well, and depends on your definition, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think my art definition is probably not. The I don't know that he really cared that much. <laughs> okay. I, don't think he, I don't think anyone would consider him devout, let's say that. Well, yeah. I've seen posts that have called him such. Okay. And, well, and made well, his... Yes. And, and attached that belief to yeah. his... His uh, his view of the planes and gods and all these things that that he was actually hesitant to actually put in any gods. Is that have you heard of that? We found out later that Gary was likely a Jehovah's Witness. Well, I think that had more to do with the Satanic Panic issue of the eighties. I thought they created the Satanic Panic issue. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so that second edition changed a bunch of stuff. They, they took out a bunch Jack of. Check for that. They took out a bunch of references to demons and devils, and they minimized a bunch of that stuff in, in maybe late 1E, definitely 2E, mm-hmm. for sure. But I don't think that was Gary. So, like, in 0E um, in and stuff, your clerics had, I believe this is true, they had crosses, but I think that was more due to the influence of vampire movies. Like, schlocky, pulpy stuff was a huge influence on early D&D, more so than mm. the Bible, I think. And, and I hope someone will, will weigh in on this. I, I don't know, but but my understanding is that it, his his perspective was that it was assumed that God was God or something like. No, that. he had it was polytheism from the very start. Mm. Perhaps. 
I mean, I definitely. Mean, in, in the lore seen... of the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Him as a person, I don't know. Who We're talking about in his basement before he actually had a had a, a written document that described the game. Oh, well, now you're yeah. going to... That's well, way back. The, un, the unwritten, who can, okay, who can verify I, that? We're going to the way back machine. We have to go back! Okay. Uh, you know, it's the people who were there. You know, first-hand experiences of it. Yeah, you can't trust them. But regardless, uh, I, I, I think we have good, I think we have, yeah, I think we have good reasons for our attitudes. And I think, I think they mesh well with our play styles, I guess. I, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that, D. Well, I just don't care about it. Like the point is what happens on earth. I mean, even in religious texts, you don't get a lot of information on the other planes, so to speak. Yeah, it's, it's mostly about just about what's happening this, on Earth. This world, what's happening here, what's going to happen later. It's still this world. To me, when I'm running a game, I think death is important. And I think it's important as a future option for the characters. That may be a denial of the, the hero kind of mindset of, of D&D. But I think it's more interesting. I think it's great that there's real danger and that the characters may not make it to where they want to be in life. Yeah, most heroes in fiction don't come back from the dead. Yeah. Beowulf, 99% of other characters. <laughs> it's just not like a thing. That the resurrection as a normal thing is just a and d ism They forgot about comics. People come back from the dead all the time in comics. Yeah, why that? I guess, I guess really, you know, thinking back to it and the development of a game, why is it important? I think, so what happens is that Something that is singular occurs in the game, and then they want to make it a thing rather than the thing. So there's not a vampire. It's not Dracula. There are Draculas. There mm. are vampires all over the place. There's not a... Dragon. It's dragon. Like dungeon and dragons. <laughs> yes. Um, well, every, it's not just small. As yeah. the game moves along, you tend to ununique everything. You, mm. you, you make everything uh, on the assembly line. And so things lose their singularity and their significance. Like everybody's special. In the Bible, there's like two or three people maybe that get raised from the dead. Yeah. In D and D, there's like, hmm, we got a really high level spell. Let's make you be able to raise people from the dead. And then it's just assumed that everybody gets raised from the dead. Period. As long as you got it, the money. It's spreading out, and yeah, and it becomes a commodity. Okay, we're gonna get Frankfurt School on this. Oh, in the Adventurers League. Mm. You literally can always be rest from the dead if you're levels one through three, I think. If the character is of level one to four and a member of a faction, a patron from the faction ensures that he or she receives a raised dead spell. However, any character invoking this charity forfeits all XP and rewards for that session even those earned prior to death during that session, and cannot replay that episode or adventure with that character again. The character takes a 4 penalty to attack rolls, saving throws, and ability checks. Every time the character finishes a long rest, the penalty is reduced by 1 until it disappears. Once a character reaches 5th level, this option is no longer available. Oh, it's just like easy mode? Or something? It says that your faction just pays to have you raised from the oh dead. Oh my gosh, what? Do you not remember that? No. When we were doing it for Dragon Con? Nope. Yep. They, they want to give you a padding from in your early levels when you're the squishiest. It doesn't mean you can't be raised from the dead after that. So it, 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 it's very common in the official d and d to have that on the table. Mm -hmm. And when I'm thinking of a setting or a campaign that I'm gonna run, it just never enters my mind. Like it should be something that I don't plan from the start. It's not like an option that you select from ever. It's not a menu item. It's just, if it exists, it's something that you just happen to come across or find mm -hmm. in the game. I think that makes it more special. Or but. seek out, or you significant resources to yeah. seek it out. Yeah. I mean, as a thought experiment, if you kind of grip that little dial, and, you, and, and you know, so we've kept it on one, and we kept it close to zero, or, or basically at zero. Wait, what so if you... This is the fun meter? No. Oh, oh, okay. oh no, that's always at zero. Okay. That's, uh... <laughs> well, I mean, one or zero, I thought that was Yeah, that, that, that is gorilla glued to zero. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, but if you if you turn it all the way up, turn it to easy mode resurrection, what does that do to a world, like a campaign setting, like a campaign period? You know, it's really thinking of the consequences of having everyone be really easily resurrected. It's an Everybody MMO. Trivial. Exactly, it's an MMO then. Mm -hmm. It's destiny. So it's about the flows of life rather than uh, hard stops, right? Like there are changes that can happen, but they don't, they're not permanent. Uh, yeah, I prefer the hard stop. I do too. Yeah. 
it's a weird aesthetic, and I think it's pretty unique to D and D. Maybe there are other media that have fairly common resurrection. Again, comics. GG, no, we is fake nerds. I just can't think of any off the top of my head other than video games. Yeah, just just video games because, I mean, you've you've put a bunch bunch of time into it, you, and you have this little character, and you paid money for it, and you it just makes sense. You know, you yeah. just lose your character. But again, the Souls games are the best games ever, and they make it diegetic, where the resurrection is not actually a resurrection, but it's something that's a property of the world that makes a certain subset of people resurrect after death sometimes and that and that affects them negatively over the course of time yeah generally. like resurrection can be so commonplace daniel's gonna roll his eyes in the Ari salvatore the grand series of books that i read or like 15 books kind of in order of wait the, you read them yeah in the, oh, wait a second the <laughs> they roll this it. so so 50 percent of us have read all of those books I read all of them, but I read and about, then fifty percent has read none of them. I'm taking my D and D, and I'm going home. Yeah. So, one of the main characters he dies. Like one of the three kind of main characters. There's like a, a barbarian dude, and then Driz. 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 Is, it, is it officially Drizzt or Drizzt? What is it? I know the joke was what is a Drizzt at some point, but I thought it was always Drizzt. I have no idea what the official thing is. I'm sure it's whatever's worst. Okay. Anyway, so... <laughs> Drizzit One of the main characters, he, he actually dies at some point, and then like a, several books later... Spoilers. Several books later, he gets res somehow. I can't remember. Is it Brunor? No. Oh, yeah. That... Uh, but but when he comes back, like, he is... That's freaking... what's up! He's an out of the abyss. I, I heard a short story one He's time. He's out of the abyss. He is, yeah. He uh, is. It's not Brunor, though. Uh, it was Wolfgar. Oh, but, that guy. But he comes back... And I read, like, half of the first book. And he's... Super scarred, like for the longest time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mentally, if you're gonna get res, that should affect you in some negative way. And there should be a cool mechanic you should work in. And be like, okay, sure, you can be you can be res, but you're gonna have to deal with this penalty. Coming back from the dead is an ordeal. The target takes a minus four penalty to all attack rolls, saving throws, and ability checks. Every time the target finishes a long rest. The penalty is reduced until it disappears. You're only going to like Transformers movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> only and always. <laughs> Transformers movies. Uh, I liked it pretty good. It wasn't Transformers, though. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think that, is, that, is, that would be interesting. That's what they want us to do. And what? Should we do that? That's not necessarily what they said in the, in and, the video. They're, they're just saying, oh, they're like, make a story out of it. Work it into the yeah. story. Book. I'm but saying, you know what? Oh, no, not, should be an opt- you're saying should it should like, always be bad. There should be a mechanic where it's always bad. Yeah, okay, I like that. That's okay. not in the rules. That's the problem. I know. That's I, not their game. That's just like them talking about their game. Right, yeah. It should be, it's, okay, I'm typing. It's really hard to come back from the dead. It is the worst experience possible <laughs> and you'll be haunted for the rest of your life. I'm Period. saying in, D, in, like, in like, D world, that's because from a gaming perspective, I want it to be like, there should be a mechanic. I think the official rules should say, should mandate a judgment call by the DM. Oh, But there is no rule. Well, it should always be up to the DM. But calling it out that there is no rule, but you should make it interesting and not like pay 5,000 gold or whatever and it be is done with it. and be done. Hey, here I am. And I, in the history of D and don't know what it is in Five E because I don't care about it. Uh, in the history of D and D, I think there have been like penalties when you get resed, at least for a period of time. But that's very mild, and nobody cares about that. Oh yeah, I'm yeah. Like, with the lower I level spells, you, you do it, have that. So or, maybe is healing is the idea of healing a problem? Yes. Like magic healing? Yeah. I don't like it. Oh, I mean, it's an aesthetic choice, right? It makes your world a certain way. Mm-hmm. If you can say, oh. Those broken bones are gone bye-bye, and I can do that four times a day. Now, maybe that's what you want. Maybe it's not. That's why I treat hit points as not actual damage, because I just don't like the idea of that happening so commonly. I think of potions mm-hmm. as energy drinks. Well, the good thing about uh, hit points is that you can just interpret them as not physical injury if you want to. Right. I tend to do that in my head anyway, even if it's not in the rules. But again, it's an aesthetic choice. You can do what you want. But basically, every natural aesthetic choice that you would make based on a plain reading of the rules of D&D is wrong. Oh, I have one last issue, and this is incredibly important. Okay, baby. So whatever decisions you make about the player characters, my assumption is that you would also make them about any other NPC in the world, including enemy NPCs. No. Okay. Okay. I would make the same about humanoid NPCs, but not about monstrous NPCs. Okay. I would say if you hit an ogre with an attack... 
you literally hit them with an attack. There's arrows oh. sticking in them. No, but but I mean I mean regarding their death and their oh. existence beyond that yes. and the possibility of resurrection. So there's like I imagine there's like a goblin hell or heaven or whatever. Well, there's just, Wait. there's so many goblins. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> can you imagine how many goblins we've killed? There are a lot more goblins in the goblin afterlife than there are humans in the human afterlife. <laughs> so what are they do? They're just hanging out. I mean, what, what is that? Same afterlife. Oh, man. That's probably really awkward. <laughs> but, you know, really the best way to solve it is to just round up to their not being souls. And, uh, and everyone's just meat. They're meat robots, right? No? One thing that I think is extremely detrimental to the game is when you remove the fear of actual death from your character. Exactly. It, it matters. destroys... To me, it would just destroy the game. I know a guy who I was talking to, I played a D&D with him over Thanksgiving, and he said, yeah, I've never... He's been a DM for a long time. So yeah, I, I never have and never will kill a player's character. Really? As a DM. I was like, what? Well, to me, there's... Okay, so the difference is that in... Video games and board games, trying again is super easy and doesn't reduce the enjoyment. However, if you tried to try again the same thing in a tabletop game, it would be ridiculous and boring. What do you mean try again? Try again. Uh, like, but, but I, I feel like we've explored that. I mean, yeah. we've, we've talked about doing something like that where it's like Dark Souls, where you run into the Tomb of Horror and you, and you happen to stick a finger in the, in the green devil face and you're sucked in. And then you start back outside again. And yeah. you just kind of repeat over and over but and over. But then the challenge attention. doesn't exist the next time. And things take so much longer in the tabletop format. Well, like fights. I'm, I'm talking mainly about fights. Because oh, yeah. fights in D&D are not about skill. Nope. Really. I mean, there's some tactical stuff that's going on in resource management. But really, it's just about trying your best to, to choose the right setup for the fight. And then hoping the numbers play out. It's about playing the odds. Yes. And so that's not fun to do again. Especially because it generally takes at least 10 minutes for a fight. Especially if you're going to use minis. So, because of Did that... Did you say 10 minutes? At least. Oh, you said. said at least. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. If so it's a small, it, quick fight. Yeah. And if everyone is focused and they're all paying attention and they're experienced players, yeah. otherwise it takes forever. Whereas a comparable fight in a video game or board game is 10 seconds. And so replaying that can be fun and it generally affects only one or a few players and so the penalty for dying in like an MMO is like equipment degradation or something generally and time yeah. lost, right? It's, yeah, nothing. That's really. pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, but it's fine because you're playing a video game and it takes three seconds. But the penalty has to be stronger in a D&D game or a tabletop game because you can actually make choices along the way. You can, you can just choose not to interact with this fight mm -hmm. and do something else entirely and still be playing the game, which is not the case with at least most video games. The medium is completely different and I think that makes... The approach to death should be different as well. The only way I think resurrection could be non-detrimental to the game completely is if you're doing a longer game and you do something like the faction thing where up to level three, your guy can be res, but then that allows you to get to the point where you actually have your character fully developed and you can actually go out and really do the fun stuff. So it makes or you it could just start at level four. I was, about to, I was a little about to say, I was like, <laughs> why don't we just start at level four? <laughs> and that's, did you know that just as Solomon, at the end of his life, married many women, idolaters among them, and became cut off from the kingdom of God. So did Gary Gygax. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Uncle Gary. And he suggested starting characters at level 3 as well. And 5e has taken that same approach, mm. where basically levels 1 through 2 are, as the British would say, a prelude to the actual game when you really start playing at level 3. That's when everybody's got their junk. They've chosen their subclass, and the game really starts in the opinion of the 5e e designers. And do you think anybody argue with Uncle Gary? No. I mean, I do. Homeboy was packing every day. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, that, yeah. now that he is gone, yeah, we, may, we may dispute. <laughs> See, I know as a player, <laughs> short, I don't feel like my, I'm packing. really taken off until I hit level 3. Like, and up until that point, like my goal is just get there so I can do the things. That, cause when I create a character, I think of what I want to do with my character. I know it's a little bit different than what Daniel would think. I never I think about that ever. Go. And John, I, I would argue that that is probably the most common approach to character development. I agree. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that's what the rules want you to do. They want you to choose off a menu that is stepped. At this time, you choose off this menu and this menu and then this menu. Whereas that is abominable to me 
and I want you to choose off one menu at most. At level one, or at the start of play, the character is complete in my eyes. Complete. Complete. That's all you need. Their story is not done because it's just started. So then why but aren't you a... the conception of the character is complete. So why aren't you an advocate for starting at level three then? Because it's garbage. Or, or why not? Why not? <laughs> like, because like, goblins. Be because able. goblins aren't scary at level three. Okay, so so. <laughs> but, stronger. But but, but I think but I think we might be able to compromise on us being fully developed as player characters at like level five. Say, okay, we just pick a level, and then you're saying, yes, you are fully developed. Now here's the things. Okay, and then we don't advance. You're happy. We don't think about advancement. But then also we have our character fully formed. Well, that's they, why we're going to play my homebrew games from now on, forever, amen, even if it's just me playing with myself. <laughs> What's new? You talked previously about how Cleric is the best class. Yes, objectively. Cleric is objectively the best level one class. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and best so level one class. If, yep. if when we, that's why like, I'm so attracted to Clerics when we play, because mm -hmm. I want we, we play so much level one that... Cleric is just going to be That's so because much level better. one is the best level. And, so I wish and when I say the best class, John, I just mean from a I dramatic know, perspective, know, not know, a mechanical's perspective. But they are, he means mechanical, but though. <laughs> it's both. Yes. I think it's really, I think both. They, it may they, be. They, they could take both in this situation. John, I've literally never thought of that. I've never considered which is the mechanically superior class. <clears throat> huh. Not once level in my life. Is, I would say it's definitely that brain space. Don't care. That's why I don't even go to D and D for that. I don't care about that. That's what that's what computer games are for. You, you know, goblins could still be scary at level five. No, they can't. They just have, like larger numbers. They of have two d six hit points. Like you could have. They can make traps. Every time we add a goblin, it makes combat take longer. <laughs> just make the goblin stronger. But then I have to adjust things, and that's hard. It's more work. The game should do that for me, or I should just run my homebrew. Somebody stuff. probably already has a list of like everything pumped up to be, or all the level one. Well, I know how to it. add twenty hit points to something. You just add plus twenty beside it. Yeah. And add plus two to his damage or whatever. But it's just I, it why that much work? Why? I just don't want to do that. You don't have to do it to everything. But because then, because then we could eliminate XP altogether. Why are we even just... doing anything? That's that's that, we, listen listen that was one of the topics tonight that was please, one of the topics please join us for our next episode on the meaning of existence yes no no but I, I actually would like to do that episode next and we probably will I hope why D and D and and what what is the opportunity cost like what are we giving up to play this game it's and my second job I mean I could be playing a RNG based uh, computer game it's bad for you Path of Exile is garbage. I could be drinking by myself. I could be playing Fortnite. <laughs> yes. I mean, these are all entertaining things. Tim, Tim could be playing Fortnite. Nope. Tim needs to. I don't nope. understand why he's not. It's better than Destiny. <laughs> nope. Yes. Yeah. I have to say, it's definitely... <laughs> this, might, this might feed into our topic tonight, but like the most finite resource you have is time, is your lifespan. It's non-renewable. You can't get any more of it. Doesn't matter how rich you are, we're all going to die one day. There's only so much time. So what are you going to do with the time that you have? Play D, play Daniel's homebrew d, d Yeah, do you want to play some sort of mishmash where you all sit around bored third or, or, or more of the time? Yes. I mean, no. No, no, not, not, not really, right? There's nothing wrong with being bored for a long period of time. It makes the, it makes the uh, rewards that much sweeter when you've had to bear through um, a little bit of hardship to get there. I agree with Jim for like once. So, so I, I would say that if you're going to game, I just, I think you should do it right. You should use your time to the best of, of your ability and uh, make it really count. Makes, there, there are a lot of things. There's uh, something called the same page tool which is a series of questions that you ask the people in your group mm -hmm. to see if you are on the same page with what you want from tabletop games, since there's many different ways to play games, even many different ways to play the same game. And what you get out of them is different depending on what you emphasize and the mechanics you use and the seed content that you provide. Uh, you should also check out Creative Agendas. It's a Forge terminology indie RPG stuff by Ron Edwards. You can go to indie-rpgs.com and get lost there. I'm not endorsing everything there. I'm just saying, if you want to think about it, there are lots of resources there that have started conversations and games, like all the Apocalypse World games and the hacks thereof, like Dungeon World and Monster Hearts and so forth, have all come out of those conversations where people are having these same frustrations, like they were playing D&D &D or like one of the D&D &D hacks, World of Darkness, like Vampire and all this stuff. And the drama club kids were like, I just want to explore my character. I don't want to like roll attack rolls. 
and so they weren't happy. And then the war gamers were like, "I want to send, I want to put people on a board." The seventy four cover says rules for fantastic medieval war games campaigns playable with paper and pencil and miniature figures. I want those things on the board right now. And then the simulations people were saying, but really, how many arrows can fit in a quiver? That's what, <laughs> that's what I want to figure out. I want to, I want to live. I want to be Aragorn, son of Arathorn, men of Numenor. Numenor. <laughs> <laughs> Numenor. That's right. So people have want different things, and it's better if everybody can kind of get on the same page. Our group is mostly sort of subtly on the same page, even though we might not all know it. I think most of us, I think all of us are, have a good time when we're here. We're just hanging out. Oh, just I, hanging I, out. I, feel, I feel like we like each other, and, and this is a well, good argument to hang out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, th this is a good argument, or sorry, this is a good reason, this is a good reason to hang out mm -hmm. just anyways. Because I wouldn't uh, just hang yeah. out with you guys to just hang out. Yeah, it's like we're, we get, we have to have a thing we're doing. Yeah, I don't care what it is. Which is which is the hanging out essentially. Yes. But I always feel like drinking is best accompanied by an activity of some sort. Yeah, I uh, concur. Instead of being angry. Like I'm not just gonna sit there and drink and talk. I, just, I, I just tolerated a bunch of Christmas parties. I went to a lot of Christmas parties this year. I turned no Christmas party down. Really? And they were universally sunk by. Let's eat and drink and just stand around. Uh, yeah, it's come on. Talk. What do you come think on. about politics? What What about art? What about religion? But but I, I wish it were that interesting, but it was less than that. It's like, oh, oh, here's blah, blah. They do blah, blah. And they're from blah, blah. I know them from blah, blah. I'm talking to this person, I'll never see I'm like, is there a test on this? Is, this, <laughs> is, this, is there a quiz? And I feel like uh, sometimes we don't completely line up, but we are compatible enough that we tolerate one another's eccentricities uh-huh and and that and then i feel like i feel like we even grow Sometimes. as players no, no, no but we even grow as players in mm -hmm. that we we grow by by experiencing one another and challenging one another hey. and tolerating one another and that we've all sort of we've played together so long that this sort of merged into one big glob glob we yeah. like to glob no when, but, but, when but, but that's what we're saying everybody should find their own glob uh -huh. and then everyone should submit Submit their wills and minds and intellects and spirits to the state. To the yes, but also comrade to the spirit okay. of Daniel. Oh. <laughs> no, no, but he was gonna, he's going to say the glob, <laughs> which we will do, and then everyone will be happy. You'll never have to think or Everything worry about right. anything ever again. You just did everything like I wanted. It'd be great. And yeah. if you're not into the glob. Why the hell are you doing this? Why know. are you spending your Friday and Saturday nights? Why are you thinking about it during the week? Go play Parcheesi. Ugh. Literally, almost any other hobby would probably be more fulfilling and interesting than tolerating other people's their silly silly preferences. Don't you tolerate? Don't you tolerate other people's preferences enough day to day? Let's be honest. <laughs> That's it. From <laughs> listener, go out and tolerate no one's preferences but your own. <laughs> be your own person. <laughs> Roll your own stats. There, there's a reason why I work from home more and more and more these days. <laughs> so I don't have to talk to people face-to-face so, at face the office un unnecessarily. You might be familiar with the quote uh, by Nietzsche that, that hell is other people. That's Sark. No, yeah. A few moments later. Uh, as Sart said. Well, I do have a degree in philosophy. <laughs> <Sartre>. <laughs> Sartre. <laughs> Sartre. Uh, Sartre. A. Sartre. <laughs> uh, the French would say. But 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 it is but it is but it is true. Hell is other people. He killed his wife though. So purportedly. Did you know? This is incorrect. See the end of the episode for the correction. <laughs> In sum, if we can summarize that incoherent hour of discussion. <laughs> it's all good. I think there's some gold deep within all that. What I gather and what I kind of think here is that you shouldn't proceed without purpose and without mindfulness into the territory of death and resurrection because that have implications in every part of your game and even your game group itself and, and the hobby as a whole for you. So don't bank on resurrection. Live your best life now. I now learned this from uh, Joel Osteen. That, that's my man. He be texting me. 
That's my man. This, God done put some people around me. Show me some stuff. <laughs> that is actually really good advice. <laughs> That sounds like a, like a good atheist perspective. <laughs> Listen, don't bake on resurrection. Live your best life now. Made by the most famous new atheist, Joel Osteen. <laughs> Gigi Nori, uh, sorry it didn't kill his wife. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Who did it? Who did it? See, look, is it me? you had a historical fact wrong, and I also did. A few moments later. It was Louis Althusser. He killed his wife. He's a Marxist. Figures. But that wasn't real communism. 